I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Jody DeFazio of Synopsys. We're going to talk today about ASIL compliant IP. So Jody, when you think about IP that's being designed into automotive, what's the difference there? What sort of problems do people have as they're developing this? So functional safety brings a number of challenges for the, for the automobile. One, one, one of those aspects, uh, if we're talking about, for example, a hard IP or a mixed signal IP can be automotive reliability requirements. Uh, and these, these can vary for different, uh, what we call AEC 200 grade levels, uh, which are really based on temperature. Whether you're whether you're a device that's close to the the engine of the vehicle and maybe you have to run extremely hot, or remember maybe you're in the in the cabin of the vehicle and you know we have might have more normal temperatures, but you might have a very high power consuming SOC which runs quite hot as well. Uh, so there can be a various requirements related to automotive there. But in functional safety, when we start talking about functional safety, we start talking about different aspects of being able to uh, respond to uh, events that may happen. Uh, during the operation of the automobile, like so, for example, a soft error event flips a, a register or a bit cell in the memory, and we need to be able to react to those in a safe manner. So let's drill down to this. Okay, sure. So Jody, what are we looking at here? What we're, what we're trying to show here is the fact that in the automobile, there's, there's various, uh, various domains that contribute to how the automobile is being operated. Some of those domains have more of a functional safety requirement than others. So, you know, for example, uh, ADAS is one that, that is typically has a functional safety requirement. Infotainment SOCs, for example, is something that uh, in the past really hasn't had a functional safety requirement, but it is growing. It is uh, coming to the point today where there are functional safety requirements. For, for ADAS. And so when you think about ASIL-D, this is all about functional safety, right? That is correct. That is correct. And, and when we talk about automotive uh, uh, SOCs, uh, we, we really talk about kind of two different types of standards, and, and one of those is ISO 26262, and focuses uh, primarily on functional safety. Uh, the other one is AEC Q100, and, and that's where we talk about reliability. It, it comes into case with uh, different grade levels for different temperatures for the SOC. So what does functional safety really mean? I mean, when you, we've all heard the term, what does it actually look like when you design a system? So when we talk about functional safety, uh, specifically we're talking about uh, various, uh, a couple of different aspects. Uh, one is systematic and one is random. And when we talk about systematic, we're really talking about everything that comes together, whether it be your processes, whether it be how you, how you run a program, the tools that you use, et cetera, uh, to avoid there being any, uh, let's say a bug in the manufactured product. And then this could be a, a, an issue in the, the safety, the functional safety mechanisms themselves. It could be a, an issue in the, the normal functionality of, of the design itself. Um, when we talk about random, we're talking about uh, things that happen during the operation of the vehicle. And, and this kind of drills down into two different areas, permanent and transient. Permanent being something that, uh, for example, transistor wear out, electromigration, that's something that you can't recover from. Uh, transient is something that happens, you can't avoid it, but you try to do your best to react to it in a safe way. So this could be something like a soft error event, flipping a bit in a register cell. So when we talk about systematic, what we're really talking about is trying to avoid those things altogether. So the goal is prevention, right? When we're talking about random, what we're looking at is, is the safe reaction to these types of events if they were to occur. There's more than one level of ASIL. What are we looking at here? What changes from one to the next? So what we're showing on this slide uh, is the, the different ASIL levels in terms of risk avoidance. And when we, when we talk about a, a product, an item, an element, an SOC, um, everything has in inherent risks uh, that can happen to them. What we're talking about when we talk about different ASIL levels is our ability to avoid those potential risks from happening. And within the, within the vehicle or within an, even an SOC, you're going to have different elements that uh, have different levels of risks required. And this is figured out when you go through 26262 analysis, you do something called a hazard analysis and risk assessment to figure out you know, what, what, uh, what are the required uh, safety levels for different uh, aspects of the design? And, and what we're talking about here is as we move from ASIL A to ASIL D, we have a, a higher requirement for being able to avoid uh, potential risks in the design. Are you finding that companies uh, designing chips into, uh, that are going into automotive are pushing more into ASIL D than they are into the other ones? And the reason for that is that in the past you used to have a separation between infotainment and what was basically the drivetrain. But with some of the things that are going on with ISO 26262, you want to be able to fail over into another system and be able to get off the road safely, or at least uh, basically fail gracefully. So that would require the, the much higher level, right? 
Yeah, and, and we see that on the slide as well, as we move from, from driver assist type situations to self-driving type situations. So as, as we are moving towards say levels four and level five uh, of self-driving, uh, we're seeing the requirements for various aspects of design increasing. Now, if I move to the next slide, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything in the design always requires, for example, ACLD. If we look at it, a, a design like this, like maybe, maybe this is a typical ADAS type of, uh, of design. But the point here is that an SOC is going to involve different types of, of ACLs for different types of blocks. And in this example, you know, maybe the safety architecture requires ACLD for the safety manager of the design. Uh, because it's really looking at, you know, if something goes wrong, it needs to know what's happening and it needs to be able to take control. So it's, it's got a high, uh, it needs a high ability to, to avoid uh, potential risks. A, a PCI Express interface, for example, maybe that's ACLB and maybe that's, maybe that's sufficient. And that could be because there's other elements in the protocol that are helping to keep the interface safe. Maybe there's higher level elements in the, in the various SOC and systems that can detect if there's something wrong in the PCI in, interface as well and, and add to its overall functional safety. And then maybe you have something like an HDMI interface, for example, uh, on, on, this, uh, on this particular chip that may not have any ACL requirement at all. So for example, if you're talking about a, you know, a, a rear seat display for, for the kids in the back seat to, to watch a movie, that's not gonna have a functional uh, safety requirement. So even this is sort of a different way of looking at partitioning. We, we typically think of partitioning in terms of how much power it's going to draw or what's it going to do for performance. Here, what you're doing is partitioning for functional safety, right? That, that is exactly correct, yes. And, and this, is, this is part of, uh, when we look at ISO 26262, for example, which is you know, driving the functional safety requirements, you know, this, this kind of gets into the top topics of things like, like ACL decomposition, for example, uh, where, you, where you, you, you can have these different levels of ACLs for different aspects. So what do you actually have to think about as you're designing these, these systems and you're pulling in third-party IP? There's, there's actually a, a lot of effort that goes into this type of thing. It's not something that you would uh, do overnight over a weekend uh, as an add-on. Uh, when we talk about ACL uh, compliant IPs, we're really talking about an entire development life cycle, uh, functional safety development life cycle. And when we, when we get into these, there's certain requirements. Uh, and some of these requirements uh, are related to systematic and some of them are related to ra random. Uh, but a lot of them are related to the systematic. So for example, you need to start with foundational processes. Um, and, and one of the requirements of 26262 is you must have a quality management system that's based on a quality management standard, such as uh, ISO 9001 or IETF 16949. Uh, you have your, norm, your nominal development processes, of course, that, that go into uh, your, your normal IP development or chip development, SOC development, whatever it is. Um, and then you have your functional safety development processes on top of that. Uh, and typically you have some kind of a, a review or certification on your functional safety development processes as well to know that they're being done in, in the proper manner. Once you have those foundational processes, then, then you have the product planning and development itself. Uh, and that product and planning, as we know, there's a lot of uh, typical nominal requirements that, that can be a very long cycle. Uh, but then you, now you have all of the functional safety requirements on top of that. And you have, in the case of a higher IP, uh, you have the reliability slash AECQ100 type requirements as well. So there's a lot of elements of the product on the development. Then we get into the ISO 26262 assessments, which can bring us back, right? It can bring us back through changing our processes. It can bring us back through changing our design uh, to, you know, to make sure that we have everything covered. Now, typically in a, in a, in a V model type development, you are doing all of these processes, um, all these functional safety processes are being done in parallel or in, at the same time as the nominal development uh, to try to avoid these, these iterations. as much. Where do engineering teams typically go wrong in this process? Is it just a matter of the expectations or is it a matter of they really don't understand all the pieces and how to work with this? Uh, there's, there's, there's two aspects to that really. Um, in, in one aspect, it's a lot that the teams may not understand what they're getting themselves into. 26262 requirements uh, are, are quite uh, involved. Right? And, and this, this slide kind of shows a little bit about that, but the point here is not to read through all the, the all of the slide. It's to show that there's a, a lot of aspects involved with 26262. It's a very, uh, it's an intensive process. It's a very formal process as well. Uh, so a, a lot of times people don't really understand what it is that they're getting into and all of the extensiveness of the requirements. The other aspect is uh, how do you design for functional safety? How do you cover things for, uh, like, like random hardware faults. What, what's really the best way to do those things? And it can have a, a major impact on, on the design itself. 
So as you're choosing IP, what do you really have to think about? What are the different grades of all this stuff that you have to worry about? We had the example earlier of a, of a design that didn't really require functional safety, the HDMI interface, but it's on an automotive SOC, so maybe it requires automotive reliability. Uh, so AG, automotive grade, for example, gives us that automotive reliability, and it's really for those you know, hard IP or mixed signal IP type situations. Then we move on, we have uh, what we call our ACE random category, where we're looking after all the random hardware faults uh, required for, for ISO 26262. And, and if it was a hard IP or mixing IP, we're also looking at the automotive reliability. And this gives that customer that's looking for uh, a middle ground where they're looking after a lot of stuff at the system level. They're looking at a lot, doing a lot of verifications themselves, for example. Um, but, but they do need certain things built into the IP. Uh, and then we move on to what our more, more recent product offerings are, which is ASO compliant. And this is where we're really taking on all of the systematic and random hardware fault requirements. Uh, and, and it's worth noting that, you know, for our ASO random and our ASO compliant IPs, we, these are also reviewed and assessed by third parties. One of the big problems as you get down into the most advanced nodes, seven nanometers, five nanometers, is that you start dealing with all sorts of process variation, all the other physical effects. We've never had advanced chips like that used in extreme environments such as automotive. How do you deal with that in the IP? What kinds of uh, things do you have to keep in mind? Yeah, this is where we talk, when we, in an IP level, this is where we're talking at the hard IP or mixed signal IP side of things. Um, and we talk about automotive reliability, right? And AECQ 100 actually defines uh, a specification, CPK greater than or equal to 1.67. And really what that means at the IP level is designing at a, at a minimum for a you know, plus or minus five sigma, or some people call it one PPM. It's really kind of the same way of talking, but you know, one PPM, uh, CPK 1.67, plus or minus five sigma. What we're really doing at the IP level is, uh, is, is working with the foundries to get uh, rules or models that relate to the, the concept of one PPM. Uh, and in our own simulations, our own analysis, we're targeting variations that are at uh, you know, plus minus five sigma or above. So given all of that, what goes into the make versus buy decision here? Is it still you're going to develop your own IP because you understand this market better? Do you, do you want to buy this third, third uh, party IP because it's going to be faster to uh, get to market and you think it might be better quality? What's your trade off here? So most people, I mean, there's there, there different categories and there's, there's a, a number of categories of people that will buy IP uh, because they don't have that, that expertise in house themselves. So, uh, you know, it, it might be a, it might be a company that's really more of a, a digital or an ASIC type company. Uh, you know, they don't have analog design capabilities, for example. So they're buying things like uh, PCI express interfaces, ethernet interfaces, these, these kinds of things. Uh, typically, you know, there's there's not that many companies out there, you know, larger companies accepted, uh, that would develop, for example, their own embedded memory compilers, right? When when we get into more complex functionality, for example, uh, something like a PCI Express controller uh, is an extremely complex piece of IP. This is not something for the faint of heart, uh, and, and a number of companies would not attack this on their own. So, Jody, given all of this, are you feeling like? We are heading into a much safer type of car, uh, much safer uh, type of IP than we've been using in the past. Have we made those kinds of gains? Yes, for certain. Yes, definitely. Uh, you know, it's a, as we were showing one of those slides, as we move from say ASL B or ASL D type of, or a, sorry, ASL B to two and ASL C or an ASL D type of IP, we really are increasing the requirements uh, for that IP uh, in terms of, uh, for example, random hardware fault requirements. Uh, but as well, when we talk about an ASO compliant IP, we're also talking about tightening down the, uh, the various systematic elements that went into that as well to make sure, help make sure that there's no uh, faults or, or bugs in the design. Jody DeFazio, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.